Okay, so now we're going to really get started with that short introduction. I'm very likely to break some of your favorite paradigms, run over a few of your most cherished cultural, personal, and scientific beliefs. Um, bound to happen. But instead of believe or disbelieve what I say, just consider the possibilities and assess the probability. Use open-minded skepticism until you find out for yourself. You must develop your personal big picture from your personal experience. Always remain both open and skeptical. If you're not open, you'll never learn anything new. If you're not skeptical, you'll never know that what you're learning is something you're imagining and making up or something that's real that exists outside of you. Something that's valid. Okay, now big truth must be discovered individually. Proof lies only in individual, personal experience. You must learn to assess situations in terms of probability instead of applying the certainty of belief to all of your you know, unknowns. That's just a bad habit. You must learn to live gracefully with uncertainty. Okay, we're going to talk about some big picture scientific models. Now, a big picture model is a model that describes everything. Objective, subjective, physics, metaphysics, normal, paranormal, has to describe all of it. That's a big picture uh, theory of everything. Okay. To be valuable, big picture science must provide a superset. Must provide better, more complete physics and better, more complete metaphysics. After all, if it's a theory of everything, then it needs to do better physics as well. And we're going to see how that works. Okay, today I'm going to explain big picture science and we'll show that big picture science derives little picture science as well as metaphysics. Okay, first a historical perspective. Uh, Albert Einstein worked on a thing called unified field theory for about the last 25 years of his life. Okay, and this was the first toe, theory of everything, first scientific toe, theory of everything. Basically, I would call it a little toe because Einstein only was interested in, in uh, having a theory of the objective world, of the physical world. So that's a little toe. That's, that doesn't include the, the subjective and, and the paranormal and that sort of thing. Now, his theory really centered around two specific values, two specific numbers that he wanted to bring together. Okay, what this toe was, it's, a, it's an overarching um, set of concepts that allowed him to unify both relativity theory and quantum mechanics, because those were the two newest and best and most comprehensive pieces of science at the time. This was back in the early 1900s but they were incompatible. They have basic assumptions at their root that just aren't compatible with each other. That tells you, if you're clever like Einstein, that there's something else at a higher level that will explain both. See, what we see is that once we get at a higher level, we see what we thought was true before becomes a, a special case. You see, before we thought the Earth was flat, then we knew it was round, and flat becomes a special case for short distances. Over short distances, flat's a good model, you see. Then we had Newton's classical mechanics, then we had quantum mechanics and relativistic mechanics, and suddenly Newton's mechanics became a special case that only holds for big things, slow speeds, that kind of stuff. So that's generally the way science works. Einstein was looking for that overarching thing that made relativity and quantum mechanics their own special case. Okay. He didn't find it. 25 years he didn't find it but he did come to some understandings that I'm going to read some quotes from, and it'll just give you an idea where good science by the best scientists leads you when you work on these big problems of finding big truth. Okay, Einstein said, there is no space which remains since space does not have an independent existence. Reality is merely an illusion. He said, it's clear that the space of physics is not, in the last analysis, anything given in nature or independent of human thought. Okay? It is a function of our conceptual scheme. Okay? That means space is a function of mind, a function of consciousness. Okay? That's a pretty big thought, right, for the kind of the top scientist of the uh, last uh, century and a half. Okay, space, as conceived by Newton, proved to be an illusion. 
Here's a physicist, David Bohm. He worked with Einstein. He was a, he was a contemporary and a, and a, and a co-worker uh, on this unified field theory. He said, to meet the challenge before us, our notions of cosmology and the general nature of reality must have room in them to permit a consistent account of consciousness. In other words, he knew consciousness was at the root of reality. And vice versa, our notions of consciousness must have room in them to understand what it means for its content, the content of consciousness, to be reality as a whole. This doesn't sound like physicists, does it? You know, talking about consciousness is the, is the fundamental root of reality. But these aren't just physicists. These are the best of the best. Bohm and uh, Einstein were, were, were two of the very best physicists. But how? See, they understood consciousness was at, the, was at the core of reality, but they didn't know what to do with that because they were looking for an objective reality. Consciousness is not objective. Consciousness is in here. It's all individual. It's all subjective. You can study somebody else's consciousness, but that's not really... That doesn't tell you a whole lot about the nature of consciousness or reality. It's subjective. So they were stuck. It was a wall. They couldn't get over that. Okay, so here's Einstein writing a letter to Bohm, 1954. One has to find a possibility to avoid the continuum together with space and time altogether, but I have not the slightest idea what kind of elementary concepts could be used in such a theory. See, up against the wall, stuck. Consciousness is a root, but how? Okay, well, coming from a different direction, actually, uh, quantum mechanics produced an even stranger view of reality, which is what led Einstein and Bohm to this idea. This is the experiment called the double slit experiment. This experiment showed that the experimenter was indeed entangled with the creation of reality itself. Very important, probably one of the most seminal scientific experiments that have been done, period. Okay, well, what this double slit experiment was all about is for for many, many years, scientists knew that if you put a wave in toward a barrier that has two slits in it, what happens is that some of the light will go through each slit, and when it does, the light that goes through each slit kind of becomes a new source. Now, notice that this line is a little shorter than this line. When that distance between those two lines is some integral number of wavelengths, then the two waves come just one phase behind the other. So what happens is you get this case. The two humps go together, the two dips go together. That's called superposition in physics. You add. When that happens, you get a spot of light. Now, what happens in between here is those are the places where the difference between these two lines is an integral number of half wavelengths, which means you get this case where one dip is another trough, and a trough and a dip, you see, and they cancel each other out, so you get a dark space. This is called a diffraction pattern. Physicists had seen, and, and, and people in optics had been doing this for, you know, for 20 years. This was not new. Light was a wave. This was a wave characteristic. You know, water waves will do a similar kind of thing. It's just a, a wave. Well, then Einstein, doing the photoelectric, studying the photoelectric effect, discovered experimentally that light transferred energy and momentum in discrete units. Okay, light came in little chunks. Well, that made it look like a particle, because that's the way particles are. Waves are supposed to be continuous energy, right? They're not supposed to come in little discrete chunks. Einstein showed they come in little discrete chunks. This experiment showed that it's a wave. So it was like, well, what is it? You can't be both a particle and a wave. So the physicists of the day said, well, let's just take a single photon, one at a time, and fire it toward these grates and see what happens. Let's fire a chunk at it and see what happens. And what they expected to happen was this. If it's a particle, it goes through and hits right behind the slit, right? That's what uh, Newton told us. A particle uh, travels in a straight line unless uh, interacted on by an outside force, right? Newton's second law, I believe. So that's what they expected to see, particle acting like a particle. What they saw, and they, of course, didn't fire one photon. Photons don't break into little pieces and scatter into various dots. They, they you know, hundreds of thousands of photons, but one at a time. And what they got wasn't this, they got this diffraction pattern. Well, how did a, how did a particle go through here and, you know, this, this bright spot is right behind the middle, behind this boundary, it's not even behind a slit. There were no light behind any slit. And they got this diffraction pattern. So they said, that's really confusing. 